I'm Carol Cohn, and welcome to Purpose 360, the podcast that unlocks the power of purpose to ignite business and social impact. If you heard that there was a way to increase employee engagement in your organization from 20, 25% to 90%, and you had your employees really happy to come to work, wouldn't you investigate that further? Well, we're going to do that today. We have an amazing conversation with a visionary, Pete Stavros. He's the founder and chairman of Ownership Works. Why should equity only be owned at the highest levels of the organization? That was a question that he asked himself for so many years. Over his career, he has had this mission to truly bring equity ownership to every employee. Ownership Works is a not-for-profit organization that partners with companies and investors to provide all employees with the opportunity to build wealth at work. This is a concept that has come out of KKR. It is now a consortium of over 60 organizations in private equity, in banking, in government, in foundations, in thought leadership organizations, in labor advocacy organizations who are coming together to help provide employee ownership in companies to truly bring wealth down to the lower levels in an organization. The day-to-day worker, the ones on the manufacturing floor, truck drivers. Shared ownership through Ownership Works means giving every employee the opportunity to become an owner who has a stake in their employer's long-term success. When paired with an ownership culture, and we're going to talk to Pete about that, of high engagement and employee voice. I want to say that again, employee voice. Shared ownership creates an alignment of interests that can drive superior company performance and generate greater economic opportunity for workers. It provides all employees with a stake in the value they create on a daily basis. It's not just better business, it's smarter investing. It's also the right thing to do. So I want to talk a little bit also about what kind of results can you get? And these results are printed in cases or in videos on Ownership Works website. Well, for Ingersoll Rand, they started with their Ownership Works program. They were three billion in enterprise value. They're now 27 billion. Their stock price is almost three times greater than when they went public. They have a working capital that's 20% of sales. Pete has outlined so many of the benefits of an Ownership Works employee ownership culture. I want to talk about some other numbers. You know, our listeners always know we do buy the numbers, but I want to talk about where wealth is not in this country. The bottom 25% of households have a medium net worth of only $300. Nearly 40% of Americans cannot afford a $400 emergency expense. 26% of of workers have no money saved for retirement. Since 1989, directly held stocks and mutual funds have grown exponentially from $2.6 trillion to $40 trillion in 2021, with the bottom half of all households owning just 0.6% of this wealth. The bottom 50% has limited financial security and an uncertain path to retirement and has missed out on the vast opportunity of wealth created by directly held stocks and mutual funds since 1989. This has a big impact on people of color. Black and Latino households combined only own just $700 billion in directly held stocks and mutual funds. That's 1.6%. And the black to white wealth gap is larger than ever. 
than it was in 1983. Employee ownership can unlock new levels of success for companies and employees, increasing workers' access to and participation in wealth creation. At scale, employee ownership can help low and moderate income households and people of color access the single largest source of wealth in America, stock ownership. So join me for this amazing conversation. So welcome, Peter. Thank you for having me, Carol. I have to tell our listeners that, you know, I am always, I'm so curious. And so there's Pete on the stage and he's talking about how companies can have, create ownership structures for their employees. And I am literally squirming in my seat because he's talking about engagement at a level that I think all of us aspire to have in our organizations, but he has cracked the code. And so I ran up to him after he got off the stage and he's taking taking off his microphone and I introduced myself and I said, I really want you on the show. And he said, okay. And so Pete, I want to start out with, um, share a bit about your background because Pete also, you've been at KKR for how many years? 17 years. How do you go from being a partner in, uh, you know, this very, uh, you know, well-known kind of hard edged a bit, um, financial firm to this new venture there? Well, I can tell you where it comes from for me personally, which is starts with my father. So my dad was a construction worker. He operated a road grader in the suburbs of Chicago for 45 years. And my dad did not in any way begrudge being a construction worker. In fact, I'd say he loved his job, except for two things. One is he could not build wealth on an hourly wage, you know, making $15 an hour just couldn't get ahead. And the second thing was, and he spent a lot of time with my sister and I explaining this, the lack of incentive alignment between worker and owner or worker and the company, if the only way you get paid is by the hour. So my dad used to talk about, you know, if you work too fast, you do the job too quick, your hours go down. You work too slow, you get in trouble. So you got to work steady. You don't want to, you don't want to be too productive. And that slowly kind of drove my dad insane. And he would, you know, complain about, shouldn't I be incentivized the other way to be more productive, do high quality work, focused on customer satisfaction, as opposed to my dad was in in a union, as opposed to the union and the company always fighting over hours. And my dad always wanted profit sharing. That was his dream is could we get the union aligned with the company and have an incentive to all pull in the same direction? So that was... If you go way back, that was where it started for me was with my dad talking about alignment. And then as often, I I guess, is the case in people's lives, you know, my folks didn't go to college. So coming out of college, I didn't really know a lot about the the business world, didn't have a, a ton of direction. I randomly ended up at an investment firm. And the first thing, as chance would have it, they had me work on was uh an ESOP. And so I worked on these are, this is a tax structure from the 70s that is not quite as common today. But in an ESOP, the employee base, all the workers own all of the common equity. And in exchange, mm. there's a tax incentive for that. That was totally fascinating to me. So when I went to business school after that job, that was really what I studied was how did ESOPs come about? Who started this thing? What happened to them? Why are they not as common anymore? And could there be a role in the future, maybe it's not ESOPs, but are there alternative ways that we could spread ownership more broadly in the economy? You're learning about employee stock ownership plans. And you were with that firm for, I think it was eight or nine years. Then you got to KKR. And you've been at KKR quite a while. Ownership works. Interestingly, it's a not-for-profit, but how? what's the genesis of Ownership Works? I mean, I know it's in your heart and in, and in your, your desire to perhaps share equity because you learned this from your dad, but there's tell us more of the story. I ended up getting into a leadership position at my current firm. As you said, I've been here 17 years, and I had an opportunity to start experimenting with sharing ownership broadly. And we started 12 years ago with one manufacturing company. 
that manufacturing company had a real issue around employee engagement and worker turnover. So high rate of turnover, employees not very engaged on the job, high propensity to quit. And that obviously hurt corporate performance. So there were issues around quality and on-time delivery and customer satisfaction, employee safety, everything you can think of. And so what we tried there was we, you know, you start with wages and benefits, fixing that, you fix safety, you um, fix scheduling, uh, you know, things that are some basic complaints. And then almost on a lark, we tried, you know, an ownership plan, this kind of dream I'd always had. What if we gave everyone a shot at having an ownership stake in the business? And that did resonate. You know, it didn't solve all of our problems, but it got people's attention. And that was the first time we ever, and, and when we ended up selling that business, that was a big success for workers. They made, you know, I'm not sure, $50,000 on average, something like that. And and so then we kept going with it. So we tried it again and again and again. And every time we did it, we got a little bit better. We learned over time, the equity, the ownership is the beginning of a conversation about employees role in their business. So you're an owner, we have different expectations of you. As an owner, you probably have di different expectations of us. So our expectations are that you're going to be more engaged, more proactive, you're going to speak up. Their uh, workers expectations, likewise, are going to be, and when I speak up, you're going to listen. So I'm going to have a real say in what goes on in, in, in the business, how I do my job, I want to be informed. If I'm an owner, I'm entitled to information. How's the company doing? How much money do we make? What's the growth like this quarter? So the, the, really the relationship, if this is done well, changes from I'm just a worker in manufacturing plant to I'm a re, I am trusted and respected in this organization. And that's what you're shooting for. So to get to the ownership works part, I kept getting phone calls from public companies, other investment firms saying, Hey, we're going to do this. You know, could you answer a few questions? Could you help us? And that started taking up more and more time. I've got a pretty busy day job. And so initially, my wife and I were going to start this nonprofit foundation to help other companies do this. KKR wanted to support it. There were a bunch of other investors that wanted to be a part of it. We got people from the labor movement saying, hey, I'm not the biggest fan of private equity, but I, this is very interesting to us. And if you're serious about this, we'd like to be a part of it nonprofit foundations, banks, consulting firms, pension funds. We got this really interesting collection of 60 organizations around the table from all different parts of the economy and society to say, let's work on this together. And let, let's see if we can build a real movement where ownership could be spread more broadly inside of companies across the economy. And it's absolutely amazing. And it's also incredibly timely. I saw some Gallup research today, today, that said there is a loss of $7.8 trillion around the globe because of low employee engagement. And that's, that's equal to 11% of the global GDP. And employee engagement, I know because we're in the purpose world that, you know, we're always talking about have a purpose. The purpose has to be core to the competencies of an organization, personal purpose aligned with the organizational purpose. You're creating the, the extreme incredible alignment between an employee and their relationship to work. And, and I love that you've got this and you're talking about a movement. That's the other thing. So gosh, so many things here to unpack. So you're getting these 60 organizations. They're coming to you because they're seeing and hearing about your success. Who made the decision to make this a not-for-profit at KKR? Well, I, I did initially. I, I guess the the other part of it was just the decision for the firm to support it, you know, financially with intellectual property, with experience. And that was our, you know, co-CEOs and co-founders who very quickly got behind it. And you know, you might ask, well, that's a little strange. If you guys have spent 12 years figuring this out, and it sounds complicated, and it is complicated to make this effective. Why would you share it? It's a pretty competitive industry. And, and I think the, the conclusion that we as a firm came to was people would do this with or without us. And we've made a lot of mistakes with this. We're in the third inning of figuring out how to do this well. If this were easy, this would have happened 50 years ago. Um, so it's hard. We've made, as I said, we've stepped in a lot of potholes. We'd sure rather 
not have people step in the same potholes. And it would be better for the movement if we all collaborate and do this as well as we possibly could together, share successes, failures, have convenings where CEOs who are implementing this can be talking, heads of human resource organizations, and so on and so on. So we saw great power in collaboration. And then we saw an opportunity to really scale our efforts. So private equity, you know, certainly has its challenges. One of the opportunities is there are, it's a very efficient governance and decision-making apparatus. So if we're trying to create a movement and spread ownership, one way would be to go company by company. And each company maybe has a thousand people, you know, from one to the next to the next, and that's going to take you your whole lifetime. With private equity, one private equity firm, as an example, KKR, we have 900,000 employees. So if you could get the top 20 private equity firms to all want to do this or top 50, you know, you're talking about many millions of people and it would happen fast. If you were going to construct a bull case on private equity around anything on ESG, it's just the governance model lends itself to rolling things out very efficiently and quickly. So, I mean, I'm I'm having chills. I'm actually having chills because for KKR and with your great leadership, and I'm sure of many of your colleagues, you recognize you could have a huge influence impact on society and wealth creation and um, impacts on gener- building generational wealth for those that have been left behind. So talk about your vision, because you've also said um, your aim is to generate $20 billion for lower income and diverse um, workers over the next 10 years. That's a big goal. So I want you to talk, because I think this is very much about the ethos and the essence, because you started with the story of your dad. And I think there's something special to Pete Stavros, because it takes visionary, committed leaders like yourself that say, I'm going to do this thing that everybody says it won't work. Well, from a movement perspective, I think the reason we've got, and I I would argue that 20 billion is is a sandbagged, very conservative number. If we get this going the way I think we're going to get it going. I would hope we would get to 100 billion, which when you look at the wealth in the bottom half of the country, that would be pretty transformational given the lack of assets in the bottom 50% of of the United States. The reason I think this has a, a shot from a movement perspective is it addresses four big societal challenges. You mentioned the lack of wealth in half the country. If you read Capital by Thomas Piketty, any developed country in the world has this problem where half the country has the bottom 50% have less than 5% of assets and almost no stock. And that's certainly true in the United States. I think bottom half has 1% of stocks and 4 or 5% of assets. And when you look at Federal Reserve data on, on household wealth, the biggest driver of inequality is stock ownership by a mile. So if we can, and, and people need to have appreciating assets and given where wages have stagnated, and all the problems we know in the labor market, people don't have savings to buy assets. So one of the ways to get assets in their hands is, is at work uh, through the ownership of the stock. So number one, it can impact this wealth problem. Number two, racial equity you touched on. I think as we know, lack of diversity in senior levels of an organization in corporate America, big problem. Those levels are overweight white male. And that's usually the only place ownership travels is at the top. And so there's a huge play here for racial equity, gender equity. You will massively disproportionately benefit, unfortunately, people of color and women if you spread ownership broadly. So that's a big opportunity here. Uh, Employee engagement, you mentioned this, but it's a total epidemic in the country. You mentioned the Gallup data. I always mention two things. One, depending on the year, 70 to 80% of Americans are not engaged on the job. Of that amount, There's 15 to 20 points of the 70 or 80 that are, as Gallup defines it, actively disengaged. These are people throwing wrenches in your machines. They hate you so much as the as the company. So if you could turn that around, that is huge. And in our experience, stock ownership and all the things that come with that is a way to restart engagement. And then the last thing that this addresses is financial literacy. So the Treasury Department estimates Two thirds of Americans are financially illiterate. So this is not a poor person's problem. This is another epidemic. And we have been working on financial literacy for 12 years. The 
take up rate is typically very low, meaning we offer it and employees three out of 100 will take you up on it. And when you do the survey work on why is that, one of the things that very commonly comes up is embarrassment. I have no assets. I don't want to talk about my debt and my problems. So if you give stock, if you give an asset, we have found you can take that 3% to 50% and have half your workforce say, hey, I have something that could be worth something. I better get smarter on personal. I need a personal financial coach. I need help. So I, you know, back to your movement point, I think one of the things we've got going for us is this could impact four big issues around lack of wealth at, at, at in the bottom half of the country, racial equity, employee engagement, financial literacy. The other thing we have going for us is the videos you mentioned. This is such a tangible, visible, like when you see the video, you know, you feel it. And that's what grabs people. And that is what is the number one source of referrals to, to Ownership Works is CEO saying, I saw one of your videos. I'm not going to lie to you. I cried when I saw it. And I need to do this for my people. This is, I just have to do this. So that's another big benefit of the type of work this is. It's so human. And it really does tend to grab people. Living paycheck to paycheck is very stressful. Yes, we're a two-income household. That doesn't always equate to meeting your basic needs. That nest egg, that cushion, case of emergency, I don't have that. So when I think about retirement, it seems like an idea not meant for people like us. With my last company, I was just a number, and that was very hard for me. When you're this exhausted and stressed out, I can't imagine how much more, you know, my body can take of it. I have a lot riding on this. It's not just about the money. It's stability. It's changing generations of poverty in my family. I'd like to say that when you look at the CEOs that are on those videos, in addition to the employees, they're almost crying. I mean, they are so human and they are so, you know, they're in, they're dressed down. They're really of their people. They talk so much about the education, the financial literacy education. I think the listening part, which came through really well, which is like, yes, you're going to educate me. Be transparent about where we are set our common goals and communicate them well and listen to me. So let's let's talk about a very specific case. So I don't know if you want to talk about Ingersoll Rand, which was a great one. You want to talk about CHI. Which one do you want to talk about? And just just tell our, our, our listeners about what happened. How was it a culture that truly became a culture of ownership? Share one of your faves. CHI overhead doors, which we sold uh, last month to a big steel company called Nucor is one of certainly one of my favorites. Uh, I just fell in love with the, the community in central Illinois and the people. And I want to touch on something you just mentioned about senior leadership. I would say one in three times when, when the program is rolled out. So not when people get paid, but just when the program's announced, it's communicated to workers. I would say one in three CEOs cry. And you're, it's, it's almost surprising because it's just the beginning of a journey, but it's often the first times that employees have felt trusted and respected like ever at that level. And, and I, I guess I've also thought about why is it that there's so much emotion tied up in this? I think peop, we all know that the system is screwed up and this is probably the way it should work. Everyone should participate in good outcomes, not just people at the top. And there's a little bit of this outpouring of emotion of, oh my God, we're on a better path. Um, so I would not underestimate how meaningful this is to the senior leadership team. And the gentleman who runs CHI Overhead Doors, the case study I'll talk about now, is among the top 1% of feeling leaders, you know, someone who just is in the is in a leadership position to serve. And the reason he got into management was to be a leader. He's an amazing person. Now, that's Dave, can you give us it's Dave Banger. Dave, Dave, Dave Banger. Yep. So none of this happens overnight, but over seven and a half years created what anyone would call an ownership culture where, like you said, people in all roles 
they the, the academic term is discretionary effort, exert exerted discretionary effort in their job. So a customer service person would drive four hours on a Saturday to help out a customer who forgot a sample at a trade show or the truck driver who says, hey, now that I'm an owner, I actually care about the productivity and the efficiency of my route or people who are buying steel and find smarter ways to buy steel or people in the plant who find ways to reduce scrap. Uh, you know, In this company, revenue over seven and a half years more than doubled, scrap barely went up. There was so much raw material productivity that was driven. So this is really about how do you create a culture where you can affect all these little levers in the business, the cumulative effect of which over seven and a half years adds up to something huge. And so for this garage door company, the profit margins skyrocketed from 20% to 35%, which is about the profitability of like a software company for a company to make garage doors. So that that in and of itself is mind blowing. And then our investors made 10 times their money. Again, on a this is not like a high flying, high flute and growth business. This is a garage door manufacturer. It was one of the best deals we've done since the the best deal since we've done since the 1980s. And that um, I think it just is a great testament to how powerful this program can be. Not and and and, and, and not to uh, gloss over what this means for employees. I mean, this this is dropping hundreds of millions of dollars of wealth that was created into a community where the average household income is fifty thousand dollars, the average home is a hundred thousand dollars, and so that's going to mean kids going to college, people getting out of debt, people helping uh, disabled relatives, you name it. And I have some stats in front of me that you have on your website about Ingersoll Rand, and I just want to hit some of the high numbers because I believe that when you started this, you, they were three billion in enterprise value, and they're now, according to your website, twenty-seven billion value. And to your point, you said the stock price is about appreciated three times. So amazing impacts on the business when you have an alignment between your employees and the business and its vision and its growth. The companies that are listening to this, what is the right type of company that should say, boy, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to email Peter. I want to have a call with Peter. We want to really investigate becoming an ownership works company. What's the type of company? The most important thing is leadership. So when this works and this goes well and the culture is transformed and the employees are impacted and feel trusted, respected, informed, it's the leadership team. It's the people who say, this is a priority for me. So when I think about employee engagement, the turnover rate, rate of my workforce, this is a real priority for me, number one. Number two, I believe I can impact these these things. I mean, there's a... There's such a weird thing in society today where it's become normal for people to work long weeks and be poor and maybe on federal assistance and for companies to have average worker turnover, 50 percent, 70 percent, 100. It's crazy. And and we're all just kind of numb to it. And so you need a leader who and a leadership team who's like, I don't want that. And even if that's where we're starting, we're going to fix it. If you have that level of commitment, anything's possible. Now, there's different levels of complexity. So if you have a retailer with, and you're starting with 100% turnover and everyone is viewing it as a way station to their next thing, and you start talking about ownership and five-year plans, that's hard. Not to mention the fact that the number of employees in a retailer is very large and the value of the company is often not so large because it's not a high value add business. And so that ratio of like, how much can you do for people without diluting, you know, the shareholders unduly, that's hard. So an easier case is, as I said, leadership team that's committed, but also a more favorable ratio of the number of employees to the value of the company and a stable workforce. I'm not, I'm not saying it's got to be no turnover, but not a hundred percent a year would be easier. Not, not, not impossible on the other side, but it, those are some. Things to think about, buying of the leadership team, number of employees relative to the value of the business, and the stability of the workforce. 
But is this only a B2B or is this also a B2C? Yeah, it can be a B2C business. Absolutely. And and Ownership Works is working with a large retailer right now. It's not it's not impossible, but it's like a graduate level course. It's easier when you have, you know, fewer employees um, and and a more stable workforce. OK. And so for our listeners on your website, you t- you show who you're working with and you show the amount of employees. And some of them are there. You're not talking hundreds of thousands. Some of them are what, 5,000, 10,000. So what's kind of the. The, the typical, we're talking about a ratio of the value, but but also the size of the company, the age of the company. Actually, it has to have, you know, very strong leadership, almost servant leadership. Um, but a little bit more about the about the size and scope of a company that should consider this. I really do think it can work at any size and scale. The range we've typically worked with is more in the, you know, few hundred employees to 15,000. So it's a broad range. We are working with one company right now that has 50,000 employees. Here's the simple math to do in terms of, geez, can we afford to bring everyone into the ownership? You know, take your employee base and say, what would it, how much equity would I need to give out to give people a chance at earning six months of their annual income, 12 months? What does that add up to? And does that feel manageable? Our experience, my strong belief is it's going to pay for itself. So thinking about dilution is the wrong way to think about this because it's an investment. You're making an investment in people. But that's some simple math. To do, you know, if you're a public grocery store chain that's got 500,000 people and the market cap is, you know, only 15, 20 billion dollars, that's that's hard. Not impossible, but it's harder. Uh, yeah, I know. Again, on your website, because because there's a release that's about the sale of CHI to Nucor, and I believe in there you said that an hourly employee and truck drivers had value of their equity of about $175,000. And that wasn't the long-term employees. That's right. But, yeah. So just to, just to peg that for our listeners and for someone who's, again, making, you know, their blue collar, lower blue collar, they may be in debt. That's so significant. And, and look, CHI, I want to acknowledge, was an, just an exceptional outcome. We, we Our investors made, made uh, 10 times their money, as I mentioned. So the numbers at CHI were incredible. Yeah, we had truck drivers make a million dollars um, over that seven-year period of time. In addition, one important thing to understand is this is always in addition. It's not in exchange for wages or benefits or 401k match. It's always incremental. This is not about shifting risk onto the workforce. But even we're announcing a sale next week, which will be before this airs, so people will have hopefully heard about it or seen it. You know, it's a more run of the mill return for our, it's a solid return. Our investors are making three times the money, not extraordinary, but solid. And workers are going to make 100% of their annual income on average. Uh, and more tenured employees will make 200%. How do your investors feel about this? I mean, are they looking at it as a pure investment or are they? you know, looking at their, you know, social responsibility and their feeling about, yes, I could be part of really recalibrating racial equity and, you know, the ability for to change, again, a a strata of our society to give them wealth. I would say it's a mix. You know, some investors look at it and say, what a great thing to do for society. And I want to be a part of helping to address all of the issues that we discussed earlier. I love this. Other people say, what a great thing for business. What a smart thing to do inside of a company. I love it. It's great for performance. And some say both. You know, it, it it's kind of like whether you're a pure do-gooder or a pure capitalist who, you know, hopefully there aren't, aren't many of these anymore, but who just doesn't give a damn uh, or somewhere in between. This makes sense. I, I, I feel like to all sides, this makes sense. So what about some of those potholes? Because you said it sounds like this is not for the faint of heart. You have to have a, a committed CEO. You have to, you know, your your senior team's got to support it, working with you and, and others. You've got to do the financial literacy, the education and such. What are some of the potholes? Well, some of the mistakes we've made and some of the mistakes we've almost made, um, you know, th- a lot of the mistakes relate to communication. So how how good of a job did you do explaining the program, having people truly understand and value the equity? And how good of a job did you do 
sharing information, opening up the business plan, finding some clever ways to delegate decision-making rights, like all of that stuff is what makes this go on top of the ownership, of course. But, you know, potholes are when you don't do a great job communicating as an example, I'll give you a very practical example. One of our early investments, we rolled the program out and when we showed the projections, you know, hey, here's what we think we can do. Here's the time frame of which we think we can do it, which was five years. Here's what this could mean for everyone in this room. And we're going to be tracking this and we're going to show you the stock price progression. We're going to show you the key metrics we're tracking. You'll, you'll be riding with us all the way. What people remembered was in five years time, I get this amount of money. That was like, as long as we do our jobs, but like that's, that is the firm timeline. And in five years, it wasn't time to sell. It was not a good time in the market. It was not the right time in the business. And that was like a shock to us that people took it so literally that you showed us. So there are things like that around communication that you can, you can screw up a bigger. Let me give you an example of like a big pothole, which we avoided. Thank God. But one of our CEOs really wanted workers to invest out of pocket. And this person said, everyone's got to have skin in the game. I don't care if it's a thousand dollars, but I don't believe in this, you know, free incremental stock. It's got to, there's got to be something. It's just different writing a check. And, and we're kind of like, God, we've never done that. There's a reason we've never done it. What if it doesn't go well? Are people risking money they can't afford to risk? So we got all the way towards a open solicitation where people could invest and it, people were showing up with, cash in brown bags and and so it became clear that people were you know out taking loans to get money and people risking money they couldn't afford to lose so we shut that down and, and never did that but there are you know there are big mistakes you can make with this there are small mistakes too uh but there's a lot of ways to get this wrong and this is as i've said this is this is difficult. It sounds when sometimes people hear it, they're like, it's so obvious alignment. Why would you not do this? But it, it, it's it's got to be done carefully, responsibly. It can't be about shifting risk to the workers. And then implementing it is hard. I mean, even from a, okay, how do I size the grants? What about tax issues, accounting challenges? How do I administer a program with like thousands of owners? Um, how do I even do that? Um, not Not to mention as a private company with SEC regulations, do I need to become a public registrant? How do I make sure people don't get taxed on the grant of the stock? By the way, what if it's in other jurisdictions in Europe? There's so much, even just in the mechanics of it, not to mention then how do you turn that into an ownership culture? And, and so do you handle all of those details within Ownership Works and KKR, or are you bringing in other um, professional service firms to support you? Because there are many in your consortium. It's both, yeah. So we've been working on this with Kirkland & Ellis, Deloitte & Touche, McKinsey, uh, you, you know, EY, there's a lot of people who have been and continue to help with this. Inside of Ownership Works, maybe it's a good time to just give you two minutes on what is in Ownership Works. Um, so far, we've got about a dozen people, you know, full strength, there'll probably be 30 people. We won't get there this year. And there's two things. There's number one, helping companies roll this out. So there is real uh, there are real resources and tools and templates and, adv and and advice on how to do those things I mentioned, structuring, sizing grants, vesting, tax, accounting, et cetera. And then tools and best practices on how to communicate it. And then there are roadmaps on, you know, how do you use this to drive engagement? What can be done around financial literacy? How do you overcome some of the challenges with financial literacy training? So that's the whole first bucket of work is like all of these practical tools and guidance. And then the second big uh, area of focus is back to, you know, your common drawing movement building. How do we really get this flywheel turning? And that's where we've got inside of Ownership Works, you know, data analysis. Um, so all of the companies we work with have to report data back to the nonprofit so we can see Who's getting the equity by level? What are the racial demographics and gender demographics of those levels? So we know the impacts on the workforce. And then what's happening to the company? How is engagement changing? We've developed some custom questions around engagement with Gallup that we require our uh, member companies to use. We want turnover measured, voluntary and involuntary. So we need a lot of data to know 
what's happening, we can tell our story. And then there's videography and storytelling, which is a huge part of the movement, as I, as I mentioned. Convenings. So getting all of the CEOs together, you know, who are working on this and are really thoughtful about it. Same with other horizontal slices of all these companies, best practices, and so on. So that's what that's what's inside of Ownership Works. And I'm glad you let us in under the hood. So um, what's the future of Ownership Works? Well, I hope the future is that it becomes more normal for all employees in the company to share in ownership. So what there's a deeply, there, there's some deeply held misconceptions about more junior colleagues in a company, which is, oh, geez, they'll never understand ownership. And if they don't understand it, they won't value it. It's a waste of money, waste of time. You hear that a lot from very senior people or, geez, they don't move the needle. Why do they need ownership? They need stock. Shouldn't it just be at the top? You know, there, there's a lot to overcome. There's a lot of deeply held beliefs by, I, I would say, particularly more senior folks, seasoned folks who've been around a long time. Maybe some have tried it, didn't work. So we've got a lot to overcome. But my hope is the future is it's just more normal. We figure out a lot of the potholes, to use your term, some of the mechanics, some of these tools and templates and how to drive engagement such that, yeah, this is just the way business is done. You just don't, you don't share ownership only with a small handful of people on the side of a company. It's just not done. And then um, I hope along the way in the future, we've got enough data and support and stories and case studies that, you know, people can go to our website and not see, you know, 20 case studies, but 2000 um, with real data around it. That would be my hope of what the future looks like for ownership. And in a way, it's it's like it's a parallel movement, dare I say, to the B Corp movement. Um, I mean, B Corp is the entire organization, but I think that this tr- truly, if if as you're growing it now, I mean, uh, the, the organization that's part of this consortium, um, it, it's just amazing in terms of private equity and government and corporations and a lot of banks. Um, and, you know, e, and you've got also, you got E&Y next to McKinsey. You've got the Ford Foundation, you know, it's like Omidyar, which I love, Network, uh, Deutsche Bank, Jefferies, uh, you know, it's quite amazing. Um, and you've also got the smaller ones, you know, the Blue Wolves, which I'm assuming is smaller and Tailwind and things like that. So, so, th- so this is great. So, um, you know, I trust that from this, and we're going to promote it and such, that you're going to get lots of calls. And so what do you think? Can you handle, um, you know, a, a big surge in, in requests and capacity? Yeah, I, I think we can. I mean, the, really, the what Ownership Works is trying to do is to make this scalable. So when people come and say, I want to do it, but where do I begin? And, you know, we've got, and, and McKinsey, I, I've just got to mention how generous they've been, not just financially, but they've done enormous amounts of work templatizing and creating roadmaps and how to's and timelines. And you know, there's a lot of help there. And we're going to do our best to try and make this a scalable, effective uh, source of support for everyone who wants to go on this journey. And we're going to teach people how to fish. So if it's someone in an investment firm, we are going to be teaching them, you know, how to do this across their portfolio so they don't need us every time. Now, we want them coming back to us to share learning, share data. I mean, that's a part of what they sign up to when they join. But, you know, we want to get the knowledge in people's hands that we have so far, not that it's perfect, and then get learnings and new insights from them. And we'll, we will continue to be experimenting with this. This is going to evolve and change. And who knows what this looks like in five or 10 years? It's just going to keep getting better given to your point, the people we have around the table. And so, okay, Pete, for listeners, what's your email? The best thing to do, just because I will be slow in responding if they send me an email, would be to go on the Ownership Works website. We have a uh, mailbox. They can, we're very responsive. If they can send a note there of their interest, feel free to send me a LinkedIn message and connect with me on LinkedIn. We, I put a bunch of stuff out that we're doing uh, through LinkedIn. So I'd love to hear from people there. Okay, so we'll do that. And, and again, in one of the videos, one of the CEOs said that giving employees a stake in the game, this is incomparable to any other model. 
exclamation point, exclamation point. So with Ownership Works, and by the way, it's a great name. Um, who came up with a name, by the way? Uh, so I, I got a credit. Ernst, so Ernst, my original name was so stupid. It was, and you can find the original um, Wall Street Journal article when this was first mentioned. It was called the Center for Shared Ownership. And when EY, which is a terrible name, when EY got involved, they're like, hey, we have this whole like branding and naming business. And I don't know, would you be open? We think maybe there's a better name out there. So EY did months of work on the low. I think the logo is beautiful and is really clever. If if anyone's on uh, goes on the website, I think the name is clever. I think the visually the site is they built the whole site. I mean, EY did such an amazing job, all for free, all for the nonprofit, all for the cause. We've got, we are so blessed to have so many great partners. I mean, when, when we sell companies and workers come into Newfound Wealth, Deloitte, EY are jumping in to help people with taxes. Goldman Sachs is helping with financial coaching. And it's a whole group of people doing wonderful things to try and make this go. So you're creating, again, I think this is ownership works is, is the next B Corp movement. So I'm totally behind it. You get the last word, Pete. So is there anything that you want to add to this um, before we have to say goodbye? It was great talking about this. I love your passion for this and I really appreciate all of your support. And it was, it's been great um, meeting you and I'd love to keep in touch. And I hope we hear from some of your listeners. You know, as I said earlier, we've got hopefully another big announcement next week of a company where almost 2,000 workers are going to make on average 100% of their annual income. And it's going to be all of those 2,000 stories. I, one of the things I wanted to do with our, the last time we did this was imagine a, a huge screen. And there's 2,000 faces and you can click on any of the 2,000 faces and hear their story and hear what this meant to them. We need more, more storytelling, more of the human side of this. That is what is going to really, I think, grab people and, and really put the wind in our sails. I am totally convinced that you have a tremendous amount of wind in your sails. You will have more wind in your sails as you keep um, getting more and more successes. But I think I have to give you tremendous kudos, Pete, because it is your passion. It is your genuine and authentic commitment to this that, that grew out of your childhood and watching you know, your dad and being the first one to go to college. And thank you for not giving up that very special essence within you because you're showing that, yes, you can be in business and yes, you can work at, you know, private equity or the biggest, you know, financial um, firms, but you can also be human. And stakeholder-based capitalism is where we all need because there's so many groups and, and also our planet and our communities that need the support and generational wealth needs to be generated. So thank you so much for sharing your story. You want to say one more thing? Because I see see on the edge of your seat. Most leaders got into leadership to to run a company and, and, and not just make money, but really have an impact on their employees' lives. And I think the challenge we've got as a society is those leaders, when I talk to CEOs and I say, you know, I've got this idea, you know, broad-based ownership, engagement, financial literacy, you put them together, it's really powerful. And human beings are overwhelmed and the CEOs are sitting there going, all right, so I'm supposed to double my profits in the next five years. I have to decarbonize. I've got to reduce my use of water, uh, energy, reduce landfill tonnage, increase recyclability. I got to worry about cybersecurity, data integrity. I got to get, you know, my financials done by the 12th of the month. Like they're, and I get a thousand emails a day. And now on top of that, oh, and I got I to I diversify my, my board, my C-suite, deeper into the organization. I do job training. And then on top of that, now you're saying share ownership for everyone, uh, implement this you know, somewhat complicated program, teach financial literacy, drive employee. It, that is my concern that there are so many priorities and people are drowning. And that's, that's one of the real impediments we got. Our argument is that all of this is supportive and foundational to everything else you want to do. So that huge list can only get done with the entirety of your workforce. And this is a way to engage all of them. 
And and I'm so glad that that that's our, our kind of our last key point, because I have been talking about employees being the core stakeholder for over 20 years. And I was one of these lone voices in the wilderness. And now that um, employee power and it's not the great resignation, it's the great contemplation and that there is a constant war for talent, a constant need for innovation, that we must, must, you know, be innovative and, and employees bring their whole set self to work. And it doesn't matter what they're trying to improve. It's just that they want to do it. And that's what Ownership Works is about. And it is a movement. So listeners, join the movement. Meet with Pete and his amazing team at, at, at Ownership Works and transform. Bring truly what you really wanted to do when you started in business or your human side. Bring it. Bring it on. Because the challenges before us are too great, and it's people who will solve them. So thank you so much, Pete Stivers. I am so thrilled. This is a great conversation, and I hope you are overwhelmed with interest. And again, I want to be a podcast at your event, and we'll see if we can get Bruce Springsteen to play. Awesome. Thank you so much, Carol. This podcast was brought to you by some amazing people, and I'd love to thank them. Anne Hundertmark and Kristen Kenny at Carol Cohn on Purpose, Pete Wright and Andy Nelson, our crack production team at True Story FM, and you, our listener. You know, we love hearing from you, so please give us feedback. Let us know names of people you'd like to hear on a future episode. How about some new questions to ask? And also, please rate and rank us because we really want to be as high as possible as one of the top business podcasts available so that we can continue exploring together the importance and the activation of authentic purpose. We all know every company, every brand, every not-for-profit must define their purpose, refine it, and activate it and evolve it over time so it has the greatest impact on business, growth, and society. And by listening to these episodes and sharing them with your colleagues and talking about them, I want to inspire you to have an amazing answer to this question. What is the power of your purpose? Thanks so much for listening.